These are thoracic radiology board view cases, and the topic of this group is interstitial lung disease. Good luck. If this were a smoker, what would your best non-malignant diagnosis be? So in this case, we see numerous solid lung nodules of varying size, though um, the largest ones are probably topping out at just about one centimeter. Um, obviously, normally if we see this, we'd think metastatic disease first, but if we're looking at non-malignant diagnoses, especially in a smoker, um, one of the first things we'd have to think about uh, would be Langerhans cell histiocytosis, or PLCH. All of the following statements about LCH are true, except So nodules are a feature of early uh, phase LCH. Um, we tend to see cysts more uh, in the later kind of uh, um, stages of disease. Um, these nodules can range in number from few to innumerable and are generally subcentimeter in size, though they trend towards the upper size of that size spectrum. And sometimes these nodules may cavitate. The incorrect statement here is paralymphatic distribution, since the distribution of the nodules in PLCH is centrilobular. What's your best diagnosis in this young woman? So in this case, we see uh, lots of small, round, thin-walled air cysts scattered throughout both lungs, and we see um, a rather large pneumothorax on the right side. Uh, in the setting of um, this patient, these findings, uh, the best diagnosis would probably be lymphangioliomimatosis, or LAM which of the following is not associated with LAM. So LAM is associated with lung cysts and chylus pleural effusions, and uh, most cystic lung diseases are associated with both increased lung volumes and a risk of spontaneous pneumothorax. However, with LAM, nodules are very rare, and when they do occur, are, are tiny, uh, less, than, less than three millimeter micronodules. So the response we're looking for here is B, five to 10 millimeter nodules. Those are not associated with LAM. List two recurrent issues associated with LAM. The two responses we're looking for here are recurrent pneumothoraces and recurrent chylothoraces. What's your best diagnosis in this case? So in this case, we see relatively diffuse ground glass opacities throughout the background of both lungs, lots and lots of small, thin-walled, round cysts in the lungs, and a relatively diffuse reticular interstitial pattern. This combination of imaging features um, would be most likely encountered in the setting of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, or LIP. In LIP cases, ground glass opacities are nearly universal. Um, Thin-walled cysts are the main feature we, was, we also want to think about. And about half of cases will exhibit fine reticulation, which you saw pretty, um, pretty like dramatically on that chest x-ray um, that we showed as the first image of this case. Uh, mural nodules don't always occur, but when they do occur along the walls of the air cysts um, are a relatively um, specific feature for LIP. Now, name an LIP-associated disease in children. And the answer we're looking for here is HIV. Name an LIP-associated disease in adults. So the most common uh, LIP-associated uh, disease in adults would probably be Sjogren's syndrome. However, um, a number of other autoimmune um, disorders uh, are associated with LIP. Um, things like lupus, rheumatoid, or Hashimoto's.
What's your differential diagnosis? So in this case, we see a relatively extensive um, nodular, fine nodular interstitial pattern throughout both lungs. Um, some of these uh, uh, nodules are, um, are subpleural in location, and some of them are not. Um, this is uh, pretty typical for a perilymphatic distribution of disease. Um, with a perilymphatic distribution of disease, uh, we'd be thinking about disorders such as um, pneumoconioses. Um, those can be relatively symmetric. Uh, we would think about lymphangitic carcinomatosis. Those cases tend to be more asymmetric than symmetric. And uh, in this particular case, um, probably the best answers would be pneumoconioses um, due to the relatively diffuse and bilateral distribution of the pattern. Uh, things like silicosis, coal workers, pneumoconiosis, or, or beryliosis. Uh, this particular case happens to be a case of silicosis. Um, I should add that sarcoidosis would also be a... Um, um, you know, uh, a disorder that can present as a uh, paralymphatic pattern, though the distribution is usually more asymmetric, um, and usually the nodules we encounter tend to be a little bit more, um, more uh, coarse than how fine these ones look. Uh, with uh, silicosis, uh, we usually uh, may expect a higher incidence of TB than in the normal population, which leads us to the next question. Which of the following findings indicates a high probability that silico tuberculosis is present? And the imaging feature we're looking for here is cavitation. What's your best diagnosis for this case? Now on this patient's chest x-ray and chest CT, we recognize there is a um, relatively bilateral reticular interstitial fibrotic process that favors the lower lungs with extensive honeycombing um, that we see on this particular image. With this distribution of findings, we'd be thinking about usual interstitial pneumonia, UIP, as our leading diagnosis. All of the following can lead to honeycombing, except so honeycombing uh, represents end-stage reticular interstitial fibrosis, and the differential diagnosis for reticular interstitial fibrosis is UIP, fibrotic NSIP, fibrotic hypersensitivity to pneumonitis, and sarcoidosis. So it stands to reason that any of these four disorders could um, progress to honeycombing. Um, we have to say that NSIP um, probably doesn't do this um, quite that often, but has been um, observed. So the uh, um, correct response we're looking for here is E, all can lead to honeycombing. What's your best diagnosis? So this is another case of um, lower lung predominant bilateral peripheral reticular interstitial fibrosis with associated honeycombing, uh, maybe not quite as severe as the last case. And so um, obviously a disease such as usual interstitial pneumonia, UIP, would be on our differential diagnosis. But on this particular case, um, the esophagus was dilated which would lead us to suspect perhaps this is a case of UIP secondary to scleroderma. All of the following can be associated with UIP except Well, cyclophosphamide and nitrofurantoin are um, known to be associated with uh, UIP. Um, now, most of the um, wide spectrum of collagen vascular diseases that we know um, are associated with UIP and NSIP, though there is one, and that's lupus, that's uh, only associated with NSIP. So um, the exclusion statement here is SLE, um, not associated with UIP.
What's your best diagnosis? So this is a case where we do see um, fine bilateral lower lung predominant peripheral reticular interstitial fibrosis. But what's interesting is the amount of ground glass opacities associated with these areas of reticular interstitial fibrosis is way more than we would typically expect for a classic UIP case. Uh, when we see situations where the ground glass really predominates uh, compared to the reticulation, uh, we tend to favor NSIP over UIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. All of the following are true about fibrotic NSIP except. So true statements about the fibrotic subtype of NSIP are that it is more common than the cellular subtype. There is no reliable way to always differentiate fibrotic from cellular cases. And there is a greater degree of reticulation. That's why fibrotic NSIP cases are often difficult to distinguish visually from UIP cases. However, fibrotic NSIP can honeycomb. Um, the honeycombing uh, tends to be rare, but it is something that can happen. Provide at least three differential diagnoses in this patient with several weeks of progressive dyspnea. So what we see here are multifocal regional airspace opacities. Um, they tend to be a little bit more ground glass overall than consolidative. Um, and with this kind of uh, presentation, um, both from an imaging perspective and historically here in terms of several weeks duration, uh, we would tend to think about um, items that we remember from our chronic consolidation differential diagnosis. And we'd probably think about um, a few items from our isolated ground glass list, especially when the presentation is in the setting of several weeks of progressive dyspnea, rather than say something like autoimmune disease, uh, sorry, um, not autoimmune disease, um, um, immunosuppression that is, um, or acute presentation. Uh, long story short, uh, differential diagnosis for this kind of appearance with several weeks of dyspnea would be uh, things like multifocal lung infection that for some reason is an organism that we're not properly treating or the immune system is having a difficult time dealing with. Um, GPA, um, organized pneumonia, eosinophilic pneumonia, uh, there are unusual cases of uh, lipidic or mucinous um, subtype uh, adenocarcinoma, and DIP. Um, in this particular uh, patient, we actually are looking at a case of disquamative interstitial pneumonia, DIP. What's the mean age of onset for DIP? So the mean age of onset for uh, DIP is uh, people 30 to 40 years of age. Next question, what's the gender distribution? So DIP is more common in men than in women. What's your best diagnosis? So this is a portable chest x-ray of a patient who has an ECMO um, cannula, uh, diffuse bilateral consolidation uh, with relatively conspicuous ear bronchograms throughout both lungs. In this setting, uh, we would favor non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema as the most likely explanation of this diffuse bilateral consolidation. Um, a few points. Um, these air bronchograms that look so extensive on this um, chest x-ray are a feature that we tend to see more often with non-cardiogenic than cardiogenic cases of pulmonary edema. However, from an imaging perspective, um, there are different types of uh, uh, reasons for uh, you know, developing non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from ARDS, diffuse alveolar damage, to drug toxicity, to trolley, to neurogenic pulmonary edema. Um, from a, just an imaging perspective, um, it's pretty hard to distinguish between these different um, types of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, one thing to know, though, is that um, with uh, non-cardiogenic edema due to drug toxicity, trolley, neurogenic um, pulmonary um, edema, um, generally, uh, the pulmonary edema should begin to at least resolve without intervention within a few days, uh, provided there's no re-exposure. Um, ARDS diffuse alveolar damage has a much different time course and probably wouldn't change very much at all in just a few days. Um, with this amount of um, consolidation, it's obviously 
would be very difficult to um, distinguish if a superimposed infection were present, especially on a chest X-ray. Which is the uh, most likely cause of this disorder? So this is going to be sort of a two-part question. Um, what the imaging findings we see here are just numerous subcentimeter nodules, relatively diffusely distributed throughout both lungs, and a lot of little um, air cysts throughout both lungs. Um, the answer to this question is going to be smoking, um, and we're going to kind of uh, take you to the next question, best diagnosis. So when we see such a relatively diffuse distribution of subcentimeter uh, nodules throughout both lungs in a sentry lobular distribution um, with lots of these little um, air cysts everywhere, um, one thing at the top of our mind to unify all these findings, especially in a smoker, um, or we would expect in a smoker, uh, would be LCH. What pattern do the nodules in LCH occur in? And uh, you may remember from our earlier slide, the distribution of uh, LCH nodules is a century lobular one. True or false, cavitation may occasionally be observed in LCH nodules. And the answer is true. Um, oftentimes the cavitation is uh, kind of in the center of the nodule uh, with a kind of a, a, kind of a bagel-like um, uh, solid component surrounding it uh, that uh, leads to that uh, kind of uh, description Cheerio sign. Um, these kind of they look like little Cheerios often. So um, cavitation may occur um, uh, with LCH nodules. Um, LCH, just a few notes, uh, can occur in different age groups. Uh, presentations can vary, um, you know, from the, the appearance of nodules, early disease, uh, to relative absence of nodules in later disease. Uh, relative, um, you know, kind of uncommon scene of uh, cysts in early disease, but much more common in uh, later disease or even a bit of both if you're kind of uh, between early and late disease. Um, extra pulmonary involvement um, is pretty uncommon in cases of PLCH. And smoking cessation uh, usually should halt progression. Which disorders are associated with this imaging pattern? So the imaging pattern here um, are numerous small, thin-walled air cysts throughout both lungs. Um, this is an imaging pattern that we can see with LAM, LIP, and LCH. Uh, the cysts in LCH can be thin or thick-walled, uh, round or bizarre shaped. What's your best diagnosis in this woman? So the best diagnosis in this case in a woman is probably going to be another case of lymphangial lyomyomatosis or a LAM. True or false, air trapping in LAM is caused by adenomas including distal small airways. The answer here is false. Um, this seems to be more of a phenomenon of um, smooth muscle cell infiltration rather than adenomas. Cysts in LAM occur because of. So folks believe that the cysts in LAM are probably caused by a check valve mechanism um, uh, you know, occurring in the distal bronchioles caused by infiltration of smooth muscle cells that causes um, air to be able to come in during inspiration but have difficulty leaving on expiration. Um, you could form these um, effectively pneumatocils that are um, peripheral to these check valve caused by peribronchular infiltration by smooth muscle tissue, by smooth muscle cells. And that um, is what we believe leads to the cysts of, L of uh, LAM. What's your best diagnosis?
So this is another case of cystic lung disease. However, a number of cysts, including two um, in the left lower lobe on this image, are associated with mural nodules. This constellation of imaging features um, is relatively common for, relatively specific um, for lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, or LIP. What's true about the prognosis of patients with LIP? Well, so it turns out prognoses of LIP can vary substantially. Um, in fact, statements A, B, and C are all true in this case. Um, some folks can have cases which completely resolve. Um, occasionally, these can actually transform to lymphoma. And unfortunately, um, a third of patients could go on to develop end-stage lung disease. So the answer here is E, all of the above. Which finding is not expected to resolve with successful treatment of LIP. So with successful treatment, the ground glass passes and mural nozzles would be expected to regress or resolve. However, the cysts um, would not. LIP has the strongest association with which of the following in adults? And so you remember, remember from before, um, autoimmune conditions are what we're looking for. Um, disorders like Sjogren's, um, Hashimoto's, rheumatoid, for example. Um, LIP, um, a few tidbits, uh, rare lymphoproliferative spectrum disorder. Um, it's a rare disorder manifesting with the polyclonal inflammation of um, the peribronchular and interstitial regions, um, possibly a response to antigens. Um, it's on the spectrum of lymphoproliferative disorders, um, which probably explains why patients with LIP are at increased risk of lymphoma. Um, that prevalence is about 5%. Uh, mortality rates can range from 30 to as high as 50% at five years. What's your best diagnosis for this case? So the best diagnosis for this case um, is silicosis or co-workers pneumoconiosis. There's a lot of imaging findings here. Um, we've got some uh, eggshell calcifications um, uh, within hyalur lymph nodes on both sides. We've got these uh, relatively symmetric bilateral masses, which will turn out to be um, progressive massive fibrosis or PMF. Uh, we've got this uh, nodular interstitial pattern that's in both lungs, but you can see a nice example of a whole region being involved on the left side here. Um, some of these little dots are um, kind of um, um, studying the pulmonary vessels. Um, they're relatively discreet. Um, there are some clustering. Um, these are imaging features we'd expect with either a bronchovascular um, or tree and bud uh, nodular interstitial pattern. Now, the airways themselves look relatively um, unremarkable in this particular case. We'd probably be favoring a bronchovascular rather than a tree and bud pattern. Bronchovascular nodular interstitial patterns are associated with uh, pneumoconioses, um, sarcoid, um, and lymphocytic carcinomatosis. However, in the setting of these um, large um, masses in both lungs that are symmetric and typical of PMF, um, the fibrosis, and the architectural distortion that we see here too, um, the eggshell calcifications of those um, hyalur lymph nodes, this all strongly favors a case of silicosis or coal workers pneumoconiosis. On that chest x-ray, um, there's an imaging finding that's really pronounced here at the right lung base, that's a juxtaphrenic peak. Uh, what happens is uh, with uh, disorders, uh, not just this, um, but disorders that involve uh, substantial upper lung volume loss, sometimes uh, what happens is the upper lungs contract the pulmonary ligament gets tugged upwards and you get this kind of steeple as opposed to a, do, uh, you know, a subtle dome shape of the diaphragm. We call this a juxtaphrenic peak. Um, this is just an indicator of upper lung volume loss, in this case secondary to um, probably pretty pronounced um, fibrosis. Which of the following MR imaging techniques best differentiates lung cancer from PMF?
Now, with uh, lung masses, we always worry about uh, the possibility of lung cancer. Um, but what's interesting about um, situations where PMF is a differential diagnostic concern uh, or consideration, um, MR imaging, especially T2-weighted imaging, can be helpful. Um, T2-weighted imaging uh, with PMF is expected to um, show that the masses are low in intensity because it's mostly just uh, chronic fibrosis. As opposed to if it were cancer, um, we'd expect it to appear, these masses to appear hyper intense on T2 imaging. So T2 um, helps us distinguish um, PMF from lung cancer uh, when we're looking at um, some of these lung masses. What's your best diagnosis? So in this case, we see a peripheral reticular interstitial pattern. Um, seems like a little worse in the lower lungs than the upper lungs uh, with associated honeycombing. Uh, with these combination of features, uh, we would favor UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia, IPF. Which is not a major criteria used in the diagnosis of UIP in the absence of lung biopsy. And the answer here is illness duration over three months. Next case. What's your best diagnosis? So in this case, we see peripheral reticular interstitial fibrosis um, with quite a bit of honeycomb, oh, sorry, with quite a bit of uh, ground glass opacities, actually, um, which would make us consider the possibility we're dealing with a case of NSIP as opposed to UIP. Um, we see that the esophagus on this image is dilated, even though this is a lung window, but you can just kind of see to the right of the descending aorta, a dilated um, debris-filled esophagus. Uh, with this kind of uh, presentation of findings, um, we would consider um, NSIP as a possible explanation um, and favor something like scleroderma as the cause of the NSIP. Which findings should suggest a diagnosis other than NSIP, if you see it? And the answer here is all of the above. Now, um, diffuse nodules, um, depending on the first century lobular or paralymphatic, bronchovascular in distribution, uh, would open up a whole uh, number of other differential diagnostic concerns, such as uh, respiratory bronchiolitis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, chronic infections, pneumoconiosis, and sarcoidosis. And so the appearance of diffuse nodules would uh, lead us to consider other things like those. Uh, with a mosaic attenuation pattern, you'd begin to think of um, maybe air trapping as probably the most common explanation. So um, certainly things like hypersensitivity pneumonitis would suddenly have to be considered in addition to um, or instead of NSIP. Um, with cystic changes, um, you think about all the cystic lung diseases all of a sudden, um, LIP, uh, LAM, LCH, for example. What's your best diagnosis in this smoker with progressive dystonia? So in a smoker with progressive dystonia in relatively um, isolated ground glass opacities, um, in this case, um, pretty extensive, um, a little bit heterogeneous distribution, um, we would think about um, our isolated ground glass um, opacity differential diagnosis in a progressive dystonia presentation. Um, things we think about probably would be um, disquamative interstitial pneumonia. Um, and uh, respiratory bronchiolitis, too. This happens to be a case of DIP, disquamative interstitial pneumonia. What are typical pulmonary function test findings in a patient with DIP? So with uh, DIP, um, the most typical PFT findings would be uh, a restrictive pattern and, dis uh, and decreased DLCO. So the answer here would be D, A and C. Um, DIP is associated with um, ground glass lung opacities, um, and some cases may be associated with some um, subtle reticular interstitial passes, which you kind of can see in this particular case. The distributions of these ground glass passes can vary in DIP from uh, multifocal to diffuse. The demographics favor men, um, overwhelmingly favor smokers, 
and patients tend to present uh, during their fourth or fifth decades of life. What's the treatment for DIP? So the most common treatments are um, smoking cessation and oral corticosteroids. What's your best diagnosis in this case? So in this diagnosis, we see multiple um, partially calcified uh, mediastinal and bilateral hyalur lymph nodes. Um, the calcification seems to be relatively central in distribution, but the margins of the calcification are pretty indistinct. Um, this is a pretty classic um, kind of presentation for um, the calcified lymph nodes of sarcoidosis. Um, sarcoidosis we're just kind of throwing in here, just as a reminder that when we see a reticular interstitial pattern in the lungs, um, not all cases are going to be necessarily just UIP or NSIP, but we have to consider the possibility of um, um, sarcoid and also um, fibrotic HP. Uh, the distributions of reticular interstitial opacities in cases of sarcoid and um, chronic, or sorry, fibrotic HP um, tend to be probably a little bit more upper or mid-lung predominant, as opposed to the more kind of lower lung predominant distribution we see in UIP and NSIP cases. Next question. Sarcoid is a multi-system disorder. Name at least three other systems that may be involved. So there's a lot of other organ systems that sarcoid could, could involve. Um, bone, for example, in um, up to 15% of patients. The liver, the spleen in um, at least half of patients usually. Um, the CNS, um, thinking about things like basal granulomatous meningitis, cranial neuropathies, um, the skin can be involved, the eyes, uh, uveitis is the common thing we tend to hear a lot, and the myocardium as well, um, inflammation and fibrosis, um, often studied on uh, cardiac MRM. What's the mechanism for hypercalcemia in patients with sarcoid? So most folks believe that increased macrophage activity that results in the overproduction of activated vitamin D, um, remember that macrophages uh, play a role in that metabolic pathway, um, cause overabsorption of calcium from the gut. So the answer here is increased GI absorption. A um, few notes about sarcoid, um, female predominance three to one, uh, um, black predominance of 14 to one over um, others. Um, and um, half of patients with sarcoid may be asymptomatic. What's your best diagnosis in this case? So in this case, we see lots of um, cystic changes throughout both lungs and uh, numerous subcentimeter um, nodules in a relatively centered lobular distribution, um, which would lead us to consider LCH as a unifying um, diagnosis. Uh, one comment I uh, want to just kind of just put in at this point, um, in terms of um, LCH-related uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, people believe that it's partially caused by a primary pulmonary vasculopathy. Which of the following is typical regarding the distribution of nodules in PLCH? So while um, we did say that the nodules tend to be um, central lobular in distribution, um, they also tend to have an upper lung predominance. Um, the other answers here, um, costophrenic angle involvement and pleural involvement are incorrect. Um, the costophrenic angles tend to be spared in cases of PLCH, and pleural involvement would suggest something other than a central lobular distribution of the nodules. Um, so that answer is also excluded. Um, long story short, in a case like this, pretty classic, by the way, um, you know, where you see lots of lung cysts and central lobular nodules with an upper lung predominance, especially in a smoker, um, LCH has to be on your differential diagnosis.
What's your best diagnosis in this woman? So in this woman with numerous thin-walled round air cysts, um, lymphangioliomatosis or LAM is a, a, a good diagnosis to consider. All of the following are associated with the multi-system genetic disease associated with LAM except Now, you can probably um, guess that we're referring here to TS or tuberous sclerosis. Now, TS is associated with mental retardation, facial angiofibromas, cardiac arrhythmias, and retinal lesions. However, it is a autosomal dominant um, disorder. And that's why the uh, answer we're looking for here is A, autosomal recessive, because the disease is autosomal dominant. Possible complications or associated findings of LAM include So, um, a cystic lung disease like LAM is associated with spontaneous pneumothoraces. Um, the association of LAM with renal AMLs is um, one that uh, we're probably pretty familiar with, and LAM is known to recur in lung transplants. So, in this case, the answer we're looking for is E, all of the above. Uh, LAM, by the way, is believed to be hormonally mediated, um, and this may be a contributing factor to its recurrence even post-lung transplant. Which of the following malignancies is associated with LIP? And so you may re uh, remember from a few slides ago, there is an association between LIP and lymphoma. Which of the following cystic lung diseases generally has the fewest number of cysts? While the um, number of cysts can certainly be um, few to many in cases of LAM or LCH, in cases of LIP, the number of cysts is generally um, fewer than the other two disorders. Um, LIP um, tends to occur a little more often in women, and its peach, peak age of presentation is usually in the 50s to 60s. What's your best diagnosis? So in this case, um, we see a, a fine micronodular interstitial pattern on the axial CT images. Uh, the pattern appeared to be um, one where we saw these micronodular uh, interstitial opacities um, along the margins of a lung. Um, distribution favoring a paralymphatic distribution it's associated with extensive fibrosis in the upper lungs um, in these mass cycle passes um, with a lot of distortion that are probably pretty characteristic for something we'll, uh, we've discussed earlier, PMF. Um, best diagnosis would be silicosis or coal workers pneumoconiosis. Um, you can see in this case that these are the areas of PMF and due to the fibrosis and retraction in the uh, volume loss of the lung in those upper areas where these PMF um, uh, kind of masses are. Um, this volume loss drags the hilus superiorly, so we have superior hilar retraction. Uh, looking at the axial images, you can see the, um, the multifocal, uh, non-diffuse nodular interstitial pattern um, that we recognize here as paralymphatic. Um, you can see some of the nodules along the lung margins too. Um, next question, individuals with silicosis are at increased risk of Folks believe that the silica dust people inhale um, can impair the cellular um, defense um, within the lungs, uh, which would predispose folks to mycobacterial and also fungal infections. Um, fungal infections, probably the number one um, one we'd think of maybe non-invasive aspergillosis. Regarding PMF, which is or are true, So 
PMF is associated with Kaplan syndrome, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, it's associated by, uh, characterized by regions of lung fibrosis. Um, hence, we see the volume loss here um, with or without necrosis. So either can happen. Um, but there is no known um, uh, association uh, between PMF and primary lung cancer, however. So the answer we're looking for here is D, um, choices A and C. All right, so let's talk about Kaplan syndrome. Describe it. So when we're talking about Kaplan syndrome, we're referring to the combination of rheumatoid arthritis and co-workers pneumoconiosis. Um, oftentimes we may see discrete nozzles of one to five centimeters size um, in these folks. Now, um, in prior experience, uh, folks occasionally confuse Kaplan syndrome with Felty syndrome, um, perhaps just because they're just names of people. Um, but tell us what Felty syndrome is. So when we're talking about Felty syndrome, we're referring to this combination of RA, splenomegaly, neutropenia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. So make sure um, we can uh, remember the differences between Kaplan and Felty is not to confuse the two. Best diagnosis. So the best diagnosis in this case of lower lung, bilateral lower lung predominant peripheral reticular interstitial fibrosis with associated honeycombing would be UIP or IPF. Um, characterize the response to corticosteroids um, for, I, for UIP. And as we probably remember, um, treatment options for UIP are relatively limited, um, um, especially um, response to cortical steroids is relatively poor, if any. What's your best diagnosis for this case? So in this case, uh, the abnormal lung opacities are bilateral lower lung predominant in peripheral distribution. Um, there is some subtle uh, interstitial, um, reticular interstitial features here, but the overwhelmingly predominant feature is one of ground glass opacities, um, which would lead us to consider NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, and probably the cellular subtype in this case because of how predominant the ground glass uh, um, kind of appearance is. What's the gender distribution for idiopathic NSIP. For idiopathic NSIP, the gender distribution is believed to be equal. Um, the key word here being idiopathic cases. What's the association of NSIP with smoking? So at present, no association between NSIP and smoking is known. So the answer here is none. Which radiologic, which radiologic feature should suggest a diagnosis other than NSIP? And so with NSIP cases, we really shouldn't expect to see nodules, hypoattenuation, mosaic attenuation pattern, or cysts. So the answer is all of the above. Any of these occur, you probably have to start considering potentially other explanations for what you're seeing on the imaging. Which of the following describes radiographic stage three sarcoidosis? So with uh, stage three sarcoidosis, um, we'd be thinking about 
a situation where we see uh, reticular interstitial opacities in the lungs and potentially paralymphatic nodular interstitial pattern too, um, but without um, substantial um, um, lymphadenopathy. So perhaps this particular image may not go well with the question because I actually see quite a bit of lymphadenopathy here. I would like to kind of just uh, kind of go back a few images and just kind of uh, describe what we see. Um, on chest x-ray imaging in this case, um, you might recognize that there's a pretty heterogeneous opacity pattern within the mid through lower lungs on both sides. Uh, looking at it a little bit closer, this, inter this pattern looks somewhat nodular um, in its kind of um, um, appearance. Uh, we see why when we look at the CT imaging, there's a lot of uh, no, just probably a few, maybe at least 100 nodules just kind of distributed within the lungs here. This, these nodules are relatively discrete, so not, they're not the faint fuzzy type that we would see with central lobular pattern, uh, nodular interstitial patterns. The distribution is not totally diffuse. You can see how the anterior lungs are relatively spared. These nodules tend to be kind of clustered in areas, but there's really not too much that's studying the pleura here. So um, putting that all together, um, you'd think about perhaps either a tree and bud or a bronchovascular distribution. Now with a tree and bud distribution, we'd expect to see probably some more noticeable bronchial wall thickening, um, maybe even mucoid impactions, uh, especially in the areas where the nodularity is most apparent, which we really don't see at all. Uh, that would uh, lead us to start thinking about a bronchovascular pattern. Um, now, um, if I'm thinking about bronchovascular pattern, I may want to look to see if the pulmonary arteries are studded. So if you look at the posterior left lower lobe on this image, you see how those pulmonary um, arteries look a little studded? That's because the periarterial lymphatics are probably chock full of little nodular opacities, which give the pulmonary artery kind of a nodular appearance. So long story short, this looks like a bronchovascular nodular interstitial pattern. A differential diagnosis uh, would be things like sarcoid, lymphangitic tumor, um, and pneumoconioses. Um, the absence of you know, airway disease, um, the relative bilateral allergy of what we see here would kind of make me think more sarcoid in this particular case than the other two um, things in our differential. And you can see um, there's relatively bulky lymphadenopathy in the subcranial spaces and at least the left hilum, probably the right hilum as well. Um, so um, kind, of a, uh, a kind of a classic looking case actually of, of sarcoidosis. Uh, moving along, um, I wanted to just kind of throw up this next slide here. Um, I guess we have to wait for this timer to run out <laughs> um, from before. So it's almost gone. Give it a, about five more seconds here. Okay. Um, and let's jump to this slide. This is just a summary of the stages of uh, radiographic sarcoids. So stage zero, a normal chest x-ray. Stage one, just lymphadenopathy. Stage two, lymphadenopathy and lung opacities. Um, probably referring to uh, nodular um, pattern findings, lymphat paralymphatic or bronchovascular, and maybe reticulation. Stage three being lung opacities, but no lymphadenopathy. And then stage four being kind of the end stage fibrocystic changes that we um, will sometimes see. Which of the following is not associated with Lofgren syndrome? So Lofgren's syndrome refers to bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy and erythema nodosum in patients with sarcoid. Um, folks may also have uveitis, uh, inflammation of the parotids, and arthralgia of the large joints. Um, so uh, the kind of the odd man out here is hepatitis. Hepatitis is not associated with Lofgren's syndrome. Um, just a little summary there. Uh, what's the prognostic significance of Lofgren syndrome? So the significance here is Lofgren's syndrome is associated with a favorable prognosis. Now, sometimes people may confuse Lofgren syndrome with Leffler syndrome. What's Leffler syndrome? So Leffler syndrome is combination of eosinophilia and transient focal airspace opacities, um, the syndrome is generally self-limited. Um, one more thing that sometimes gets confused um, between these two syndromes is another syndrome, Dressler syndrome. Do you remember what that is? So Dressler syndrome is syndrome of secondary pericarditis in the setting of some sort of cardiac um, injury. 
Um, symptoms include fever, pleuritic pain, pericardial effusion, um, goes by names such as post-MI syndrome, for example. And this is our final case. Best diagnosis, please. So the imaging features on this uh, case are, looks like a, um, a septal um, pattern. Um, and there's also a nodular interstitial one, which probably be best characterized as bronchovascular. Um, uh, you can see this um, small, solid kind of nodular pattern. Um, some of them travel along the septi, uh, resulting in what looks like a beaded or a nodular septal appearance. Um, this is relatively asymmetric. It looks a little bit worse in the anterior left upper lobe here and not so bad, for example, in the posterior upper lobes. Um, this happens to be a case of lymphogenic carcinomatosis. Next question is, what malignancies are most frequently associated with uh, lymphogenic carcinomatosis? And the answers we're looking for here are breast, lung, stomach, pancreas, and colon cancer. And our final question is, which of the following is false regarding lymphogenic carcinomatosis? So unfortunately, mortality is pretty high when we see this imaging feature. So it's uh, been described by folks to be almost as high as 50% uh, mortality rate at three months. So statement A is correct. Um, this amount of, um, you know, kind of um, this disease within the interlobular septi can impair gas exchange. Um, and lymphogenic carcinomatosis can occur with dis uh, diffract extension of tumor. Um, usually these are cases of lung cancer and lymphoma. Um, the statement that's false here is B. Uh, the distribution of lymphogenic carcinomatosis is usually asymmetric. And that completes our interstitial lung disease um, cases.